It's called What Kind of Man. fan of fantasy stories, most of them involving the fairy realm, fairy being spelled F-A-E-R-I-E in this case. Um, a theme that comes up often in these stories is the Seely and the Unseely courts. I originally thought they were from, from Irish mythology, but it turns out they are from Scottish, though there are different Irish fae in the Seely and Unseely courts. The Seely Court is typically seen as the light court, and the Unseely Court is, is usually seen as its dark counterpart. Um, of course, there are many different stories and interpretations of these two courts in different writings, and this poem is my observ of observances of these stories. Right now, it doesn't have a title. The Seely and Unseely Courts, one dark, one light, but both should be called gray. There are dark and light tendencies in both. Both have their monarchs and peasants, their mischief makers and their peacekeepers, their ways of keeping peace, their mercy and their punishments, their beauty and, the br and their brutality. Nothing is ever for certain. A light in the dark, darkness in light. Which side will you choose in this eternal fairy war? Thank you. I'd like to tell Tennyson about the tiny stones strewn about the gnarled rocks, solidly bracing the edge of my world, where the silky waves barely lap at the shore. 
And nothing, nothing is breaking, at least not today. Today the ocean twinkles my way, while the trees that it birthed form a hedge far away, and another and another, more closely observed, sculpted of tufts of immobile leaves, the most tenacious of these most tenacious seeds, find, that finds a home on the open sea, stands at the edge, a distance apart, bearing alone the wind's frequent cuts. It's a thing we've both known. There, tilted away from the throng, the lone tree grows strong and well-formed, and nothing, nothing is breaking today. Thank you. Um, my next poem I titled, You Didn't Say, and I actually um, have started giving my poems nicknames too. And this one's name is Yellow. So, um, yellow, the color of a bright kitchen, the promise of a daffodil, the warmth of a summer sun. You didn't tell me death comes in such shades. So small, I, I'm sorry. Um, Sorry. You didn't tell me death comes in such shades, so small and so grayed, like a wounded canary fading into dusk. You who were the blazing yellow of a thousand suns, now stolen away, I talk to you with diminishing hope that you can still hear the love words unsung. I'm scared of what's coming, of the chasm that divides, and the chasm inside where bright used to stay. You didn't tell me how this would feel, towering over your towering strength, now tiny and curled, you who brought me into this world. It's terribly wrong for yellow to behave in this inappropriate way, since you didn't say. Thank you. Uh, this song, um takes as its uh, jumping off point the, uh, the death of the famed Western figure Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, Wild Bill uh, was shot to death while playing poker in a saloon. And uh, legend has it that the, uh, the hand that he was holding at the time of his demise was uh, two pair, a pair of aces and a pair of eights. And uh, ever since that time, there's, there's uh, been a gambler's superstition around that, the, the hand of aces and eights. And you hear references to aces and eights as a harbinger of bad luck in a lot of old uh, blues and folk songs. And that's something that uh, uh, persists as a superstition to this day. So. Out in Deadwood, South Dakota, a century has passed since Bill Hickok played the card game that would prove to be his last. Never should a side where he couldn't see the door as the bullets racked his body, his cards fell down on the floor. Dead man's hand. Dead man's hand, soon the word spread like a wildfire all across the land. How the aces and dates had sealed his fate. Dead man's hand, dead man's hand. Now you peek at your cards and you try not to smile. Two pair is the best hand you've been dealt in quite a while. Then you take another look and it hits you with a jolt. A little voice is telling you to fold your cards and bolt. Dead man's hand, dead man's hand. Time to ask yourself, are you a superstitious man? With aces and dates, do you tempt fate? Dead man's hand, dead man's hand. Some fool throws half his stack in, but you know he's holding nothing. 
Cause he taps his fingers on the table every time he's bluffing. Then another fella calls him and the guy next to you raises. You tell yourself you haven't seen a pot this big in ages. There's a knot in your stomach and a lump is in your throat. You stayed in with your two pair, lost out to a sixes boat. In the sky there's thunder booming, though there's not a drop of rain. Is that wild bill reaching out for you and calling out your name? Dead man's hand, dead man's hand leading you away to the valley of the damned. With aces and dates, you sealed your fate. Dead man's hand, dead man's hand, dead man's hand, dead man's hand. This is a poem that was written about a march a number of years ago when I was packing up to move. The Frog Prince, drifting to the top of the debris unearthed on moving day. A frog, green plastic, 18 inches tall, one side bashed in. Scrawled across its chest in bright red nail polish, slightly blurred. You are enchanting. <laughs> From the corner of an almost empty cupboard, I disinterred another gift. Small white china mug cupping a bullfrog within its ceramic walls. When I drank my milky coffee, its knowing eyes peered up at me, emerging from the murk. <laughs> Its giver thought himself a spellbound prince, trapped in the semblance of a toad. My role was to kiss and make him well. He desired a princess who never would tire, never question or rebuke. When the world grew real around him and enchantment faded, he grew squat. Envy corroded his skin. Other damsels could not find the magic words to free his prince inside, who sickened and then swiftly died. Now I am left on moving day to find a home for a plastic frog and the small green beast which lurks at the bottom of my cup. This is a, a song that we wrote for our son's wedding last July um, when he was very small. Before he was two, his favorite thing to do was to watch Sesame Street and sing Sunny Day. And that is the chorus of the song. And the actual words we're going to use, we understand since this is supposed to be Irish themed. Somewhere I've learned this from my own Norwegian heritage, which of course has nothing to do with Ireland that the words he actually used were an ancient Irish Norwegian greeting, so. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, it all ties in. We're all Irish under the skin, <laughs> sure aren't not. we? Aye. You ready? I think that was Scotty. Huh? Okay, well. I did my best. So excited. <laughs> He's 55, okay. yes. Take two, take two. In the control room, and that's take two. I'm an idiot. Gosh, we know that. I'm old. <laughs> Sorry. 
called my song <laughs> Duh. dark night of my soul that lasted for years finally I just let it go and beneath the surface of pain and despair rose a person no longer alone not alone a person no longer alone. So children of mine, let my lessons suffice. Release as I've aged and I've grown. Reflections of steps I thought I had chosen in truth were no more than the fears of my youth. And in Just moments that pass and then heal and then heal are the moments that pass and then heal. So children of mine, let my lesson suffice. Release as I've aged and I've grown. Reflections of steps I thought I had chosen in truth were no more than the fears 
dreams of my youth and in my love that which I know My son and my daughters alike, their search for the stones in the brook. And often there's nothing this journey man adds but the love given and that which they took, which they took. Yes, the love given and that which they took. So children of mine, let my lesson suffice, really. So this morning, I want to share with you some other attributes of spring that excite me, because spring is about life, and it's about transformation. Now, I don't know if I actually wrote this. These words are so strange. It seems like they're not mine, but here's what you have. Life begins when you let it happen with intention. Transformation. The power of transformation belongs to those who see with wings the joy and delights that rest in every little thing. The color and the harmony that sound from soul's bright light, the silver sylphin symphony of love and life in flight. Oh, to swoop an effortless glide from near to far and not be over wide or stretched beyond our par. When view we from infinite perspective, see the whole, the minute, with clarity's perfection. A lilting elfin dance between the pages of the book that knows no limit to the ways in which it looks. So when we finally know our lines, we've read them in between and truly understand at last what they really mean. Come float with me on inner air, spiraling up and downward there. But oh, remember, each has its price to swoop and dive and realize uses energy and life expended, poured out whole, that each oblation lived fills heaven's cup with soul. Where do butterflies go when they die? And why, oh why, oh why, do they fly? Wouldn't it be better if they never tried? All that energy spent, and for what, and why? We waste our time when we try to frame a life <clears throat> upon a parchment plain. No peace is ever isolated, free, but flows with some magnetic harmony in scenes as yet we cannot see. So lift off and power with me the beauty of transformity, the power, light, and soul to free, to truly see and truly be the wings of life's eternity. Thank you for listening to my words. Peach and pear, apricot.
I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org.